Okay. All right, fellas. I, uh, so um, Tom and his family were traveling back from South Africa last week and they had a layover in Atlanta. So they came over to the house and we got into this conversation again. And so I was like, man, we have got to get this recorded to share uh, this is cool stuff. Cause I, I like you have been just kind of geeking out about human performance and these little optimizations. And, and we're, we're going to dive into this about the ways like you think these little things are unrelated, but they're all related. Everything's related. So Tom, we are so excited to have you here, man. Grateful, grateful to have you on the show. Oh, I'm happy to be here, Greg. And it's, it was great to spend time with your family and you guys make the best crepes ever. <laughs> and, uh, and your super nachos were fantastic. So That's we, awesome. We love spending time with you guys. It was awesome. Yeah, it's the, isn't that the best? Like getting together with friends and having good food and good adventures. So just some background too for the listeners, like our families have had adventures all over the place. We've done some cool things and created some cool memories together. And uh, absolutely, this awesome I still, stuff. I still can't remember the time we were hiking to Everest Base Camp and you have your son Parker on your back as we're hiking because he's fatigued and you're just yeah it was it was that was epic it was really oh, cool. that was a great one man uh, oh that was a great one all right so give us give us a little bit of background um yes. on how you got into yeah because it well it'll all related but it seems yeah, so, like so yeah it's, it's interesting because i i am a general dentist i um i went to ucsf dental school and graduated and I was really fascinated with helping people. And so I, I found that there was a lot of a, a subgroup of people that had a hard time getting dental treatment done and they were these high fear patients. And so I ended up going and doing some extensive training in uh, IV sedation. And so very few of us dentists are trained in, in putting people to sleep via IV. And, uh, and while they were asleep, I would take care of their dental needs. And so where this comes along is, is that I would find people as I would put people to sleep and without them even knowing, we'd find that they would have different challenges with their breathing while they're sleeping. So when they would wake up, I would say, you know what? I noticed that you were having some events that you stopped breathing for a short period of time. I really do think that you should go get some help on this. And this was now, mind you, this was a long time ago. And um, I found that when we, I share that with patients and they were talking to their primary care doctors, they'd run into all these blockages. Yeah. And so I kind of got a little frustrated and, and, and so I decided I'd open my own sleep lab. So an overnight sleep lab where we would have certified people that would, that would do these overnight sleep studies to help people out. And then we would connect with, um, we'd connect, you know, we have a, a great sleep doctor that would do the diagnosis so they could, they wouldn't run into these roadblocks. I was just trying to make it easier and, and, um, and, you know, fast forward now that that was like, you know, 13 years ago, um, you know, I've since closed my sleep lab and um, I've learned a lot that I've been you know, treating patients with sleep apnea from a dental perspective. And we've had some new advances in the last five years that are just, it's been phenomenal. So what I did 13 years ago is different than I'm doing now. And ultimately, we're actually now getting to the core element of treating the source of these problems, not just ultimately treating the symptoms. And, uh, and that's, what's super exciting. Yes. And, and what, what we'll get into here in a minute is how, well, not only sleep, I think, I think it's, it's becoming more and more kind of common knowledge of like, look, the, the quality of your sleep is a huge determining factor for so much, but what's interesting is the, the dental route here and just how, how what's going on in your mouth is, having a huge effect on what's going on in your body and, and sleep and breathing. So it's, it's all this combination of all these little, uh, the functions, right. These systems in the body and how, like when they start, when one gets off a little, that yeah. can just have this cascade effect on all these other areas of life. And so you're having symptoms in like one area of your life, maybe it's focus or behavior frustration. I mean, and you have some awesome examples. I hope you'll share of like, this is just coming up and like, well, let's, let's trace this back and see if it comes back to even breathing and yeah. the quality of your sleep. Greg, you make such a great point. And, and I, I think so often we our, our society, unfortunately is so targeted at treating symptoms and we're really quick to give medications for these different these different challenges. And what I really like is getting to the core element of what's really causing it, going upstream and, and really find out yeah. what the source is. 
And then once we tr fix that, we find that the ripple effect of, of the things that are downstream also improve. Yep. Um, you know, so one element that we, so with, with, with um, the things that we do, um, one, one thing that I do is as I work with a lot of children that are struggling at school, ADHD, you know, we, we heard this a lot. Why are kids having more ADHD and a dip, hard time focusing and concentrating than we ever have? And it's interesting is, is that when we look back at, um, there have been some studies that have looked at skulls of, of humans. And we look back at um, what the skulls were like 400 years ago, we noticed that jaws were big and broad and wide. And consequently, the, the jaws, the upper jaw and the lower jaw is what forms the airway that's the collapsible part of the airway. And so as the jaw over time has been getting narrower and smaller, our airways are getting narrower and smaller. And so it's much easier to get how those airways blocked. So, and okay, then this is where this is where I want to start geeking out here because you're like, okay, well, yeah, so it's a little small, a little tighter airway, like it's still working, like I'm breathing, I'm not dying, like what are you talking about? And this is where just the subtle but significant difference, yeah. even a slight difference in breathing quality now starts to, uh, I don't know, I like the idea of the cascade effect into all these other areas, including ADHD. Yeah. Yes, that's that's so true, and and so what we find, right, is is um, the upper jaw forms the the bones that, that support the nose, and so if the upper jaw is really narrow, or we, you know, in dental terms, we say a high vaulted palate. In other words, a really narrow um, mouth. So when we look, if we were to compare the jaw how it should be, it should look like a big. Um, if we were to take the jaw and kind of look at it from a bird's eye view, we want to see a big dome. We want to see a big broad arch, but yet we're seeing in more modern jaws, more Gothic arches. So, so it's, it's, it rounds in the front, but it narrows in the back. And when that occurs, it changes so many different elements. One, it changes our ability to breathe through our nose. All of a sudden our nose doesn't have the same diameter of, of, pipes, if you will. So we have a septum that runs down and supports our nose. And we have these great filters on the sides of our nose. We call them turbinates. But if, if that space becomes too narrow, it requires a lot of effort to breathe through our nose. And our body is automatically wired because we can only go without oxygen, say three minutes for the average person. It's wired to then go to plan B, which is the mouth. And what we find is if we do more mouth breathing, then that ultimately will change the position of the tongue. It changes the, the facial development and the jaw development such that we get this downward backward development in the face and that makes that pipe even narrower. So, so you know, just from an overall perspective, imagine breathing through a boba straw. It's a lot easier to breathe through a boba straw. Now, if you switch to a coffee straw, the resistance to try to get the same airflow through that. Well, coffee straw is so hard that the body looks for a plan B and it shifts to the mouth breathing. Okay, so and I, I guess I want to emphasize, you're saying the mouth is plan B. Like breathing exactly. here is plan B, that breathing design is primary through the nose. Yeah, so often the nose is like, we, in our society, we view it as this hood ornament on our right. face. Right, <laughs> it's just like secondary <laughs> if I'm chewing on something. <laughs> exactly, right? I mean, it's just like, I gotta make sure my nose looks good. And um, so you, you, people have different cosmetic procedures on their nose. However, really the nose function is incredible, right? So let's just talk about some of the basic things the nose does, right? So the nose it helps to, um, as you breathe in through your nose, it will warm the air, it filters the air before it goes to the lungs, and it humidifies the air. Whoa. Now, the turbinates inside the nose cause the, rather than the air to go straight in, it kind of causes to circulate up and, and kind of um, as it goes up higher in the top part of the nose, we have this, or, this, this sinus system up there called the paranasal sinuses. So that's a fancy term. Basically, it's a different type of sinuses that we're normally used to. But in that sinus, we produce our own nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is known as a natural 
uh, blood pressure medication. It's also a sterilizer. So it helps to sterilize the, the breathing. As we're breathing through our nose, it, it's antiviral, it's antifungal, it's antibacterial. So here is a scenario where not only are we filtering our air, we're cleaning it, and we're also helping that nitric oxide also helps it to better transmit to our lungs. We have better exchange in our lungs so we can be much more efficient in our breathing. Wow. Now, if we take that away and we breathe through our mouth, here we have unfiltered, dirty air going straight to our lungs. And how do our lungs typically respond to that? With inflammation. And if you really exert yourself when you're exercising and you're breathing through your mouth and we get this we hear this a lot. People have exercise-induced asthma. It's because we're we're taking that dirty air, we're shoving it into our lungs, oh, and we get inflammatory response. Whoa! So okay. With, yeah. So, <laughs> I I love this stuff so much. Um, when I was young, my brother punched me and kind of like broke my nose, yeah. and and I had really small nasal airways, right? The passageways. And so I felt like anytime I was trying to breathe through my nose, it was, I had the coffee straw effect. Right. Yes. And so like my whole life, I'm just mouth breathing uh, because yeah. it was so small. And then after we were out at your house um, a while ago, you were telling me about, man, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta sleep with your mouth closed. And I literally, yeah. I put some tape over my mouth to, yes. Lip- to try to breathe through your nose. And I'm like, I'm going to suffocate. I'm going to suffocate during the night here because like, it was so hard and my nasal, those passageways were so small, but I went for it anyways and, and they actually expanded yes. and I felt all kinds of improved effects in breathing and all that stuff. But let's, let's dive into like the response there. Uh, let's yes. do sleep. Let's do the, the change that's happened physiologically and, and all the benefits. Like, why does this even matter? Yeah. So, so first of all, in the nose, you have two structures, right? You have hard tissue and you have soft tissue. And so, you know, when you had that trauma, the hard tissue, you know, the nose broke and that, that made a, a physical um, constriction on your airway. And so, but you still have soft tissue that can respond. And so a big part of what can happen when you're doing a lip taping or even there's different exercises that can, can be done that you can retrain the soft tissue. There was a a doctor in the Ukraine years ago, and he didn't have the benefit of albuterol and these other medications to treat some of these patients that had asthma, but he helped them. Uh, he developed these series of exercises that helped to use and really to kind of mimic this fight and flight response that we can have to retrain some of the soft tissue in the nose. And so um, his name was Buteco. And so if you take, you hear these buteco breathing techniques and, you know, to your listeners that want to see if they, what they can do to improve just without expanding the jaw and without addressing the heart tissues, let's see what you can maximize on the soft tissue. Mm. That's a great uh, technique that you can develop. Um, uh, Patrick McEwen is an author and he's really kind of mastered this and, um, and, and he even teaches different uh, training, but I think he even has YouTube videos. So you can go on, if you were to Google um, or look up YouTube videos on Buteco breathing, that's, a, that's another great um, element that you can kind of learn about how to address some of the soft tissue response so we can breathe better through our nose. That's awesome. So, so yeah, if, as, we, as, we, as we are breathing through our mouth, unfortunately, we breathe too much. So we breathe off too much of our own carbon dioxide. And that we need our carbon dioxide because that helps once again for better exchange of oxygen in, in our lungs, in our cells. And so we, we need to slow down our breathing. We need to breathe better, more through our nose. We need to have good effective breathing. And, and so um, it's interesting, even physiologically, if you breathe through your mouth, typically you're more chest breathing. Mm-hmm. You're using your chest muscles. And, but if you breathe through your nose, you use your diaphragm to breathe in. And that typically gets a more, you get more concentrated oxygen when you use your diaphragm. And that's more of the yoga breathing. It's breathing through your nose, not your mouth. Uh, breathing through your mouth actually triggers different stress responses. And if you're having the chest. So once again, we're kind of working against we're, um, this 
the, the para, uh, parasympathetic nervous system, we really want to um, use that to our advantage. And uh, when we breathe through our chest, we start triggering uh, things that can trigger anxiety and, um, and, uh, and other challenges as well, other inflammatory responses. Oh, oh, oh. yeah. And there's a, a direct, yeah. It's the, it's the parasympathetic, right? It's that system where it's, it's related to chest breathing. Right. So the sympathetic, the sympathetic, the sympathetic, sympathetic. Okay. Sympathetic. And so you get this chest breathing and, and again, there's, there's all this physiology, physiological responses, even in emergency medicine, right. As I'm studying that I've worked on MS for a while, like you're, you're watching for those things, but just this chest breathing and, and mouth breathing, that's, that's for kind of, it's plan B. We're exactly. supposed to be going through the nose. Yeah, we, we need to filter and more efficiently get that oxygen in so then our bodies can be more efficient. What happens at nighttime is, you know, let's let's just let's just step away from day, you know, our na- during the daytime where we have control of how we breathe. At nighttime, all bets are off because we yeah, we unless we are physically taping our lips closed, we are our body's gonna go to what where's the easiest ways to breathe. And so that's and that it's pretty critical because what happens when we sleep at night during certain phases of, of sleep, our muscle tone relaxes during REM sleep, our body is paralyzed. And during that peril, that, that process of being paralyzed. So we don't act out our dreams. We have a lot of muscles that are relaxing, especially in the throat and pharyngeal area. So the back of the tongue, the, the, the base of the tongue, the, the throat, those tissues can collapse and that can stop breathing from the, the pipe from the nose and the mouth kind of come together and then they go down to the lungs and that that tongue is what falls back and blocks the airway and so in that re- in those responses our body then will send off adrenaline and we'll have this sympathetic nervous system and what we'll find is we have this fight and flight response all night long oh. so much inflammation as a result of this inflammation, we have so many ripples that affect other aspects of our health, right? But the biggest thing is, you know, we're not breathing effectively and it's kicking us out of our, our normal sleep cycle. So we're not getting the restorative sleep. We're not getting the REM sleep to let our bodies, REM sleep is when our, our, our brain is more active during REM sleep than it is when we're awake. So we're doing problem solving, we're locking in short-term memories. It's really a, a wonderful, we, we, we dream during that phase. Um, deep sleep is when our body can heal itself. So our body has this amazing process of, of healing, but uh, it can't heal if, you're, if your heart is beating 120 beats you know, a minute when you're sleeping. It should and be- it's scared, right? It's, it, it's slipping yeah. into like, oh, I, I gotta survive here. Yes. So it's kicking you out of healing. Yes. And there's a cleansing process. It's kicking you out of, well, optimization and, and learning and, and uh, learning retention. Exactly. I mean, there's all, let's dive a little bit deeper into that. Cause you and I, we, we talk through examples and stories like what, what's the cost of, of inefficiencies of air exchange and, you know, interrupted sleep. Like what, What's the effect? How does that play out? So, so for it's interesting with adults, if we have fragmented sleep, whether it's, and, and let's, let's go back when, when um, let's, let's not even talk about uh, breathing, but let's just talk about fragmented sleep. Think about when you had your, your first baby that was born and you, you know, you're getting up frequently all the time and, and your sleep, you're, you're not getting into that sleep cycle and it's being interrupted and you're just fatigued, mm-hmm. right? So, so that's, so just interrupting your sleep fatigues you and causes problems. And what they did is they did a study with these medical students and they interrupted their sleep for like, I think it was like two days and, and they started developing chronic pains after that. And then they let them sleep normally and the chronic pains went away. So it's interesting to see how how healthy medical students that they then just fragmented their sleep, right? So that's one aspect where you see on the healing phase of, of sleep. Now, what's what's interesting is now when you look at uh, interruption of your breathing along with the sleep, 
that's another aspect of it. So with kids, kids don't get tired if their sleep is getting interrupted, they get wired. And when they did a study and they, they put in this room with kids that have uh, ADHD and they put in this room, you know, um, uh, and you know, ADHD is, is really a diagnosis based on observed behavior, right? Mm -hmm. it's not a, there's not a blood test for it. There's not a, um, a cellular uh, you know, DNA evaluation. It's purely observation uh, driven. So when they have these trained uh, psychiatrists analyzing who, was, who in this room had ADHD and who had um, obstructive um, sleep apnea, they couldn't tell the difference. So here's a scenario where, and, and now we know that over 50% of people that have been diagnosed with this, really it's breathing related. So we, we need wow. to- Wow. And yes, and, and stop giving medication, but let's start, let's start analyzing and, and really assessing people's breathing before we start jumping into um, addressing things with medication. So j just to reemphasize this, Yes. It's possible that there's a direct connection between uh, breathing inefficiencies, interrupted sleep, and behavior. Absolutely. So, and, and, and there's other ca cases of that as well. So, um, I, I'll share an example of a friend of mine. He, uh, he he's 47 years old, very active. He was our, you know, he's just. He's the guy that just inter, uh, energizer bunny, right? He's always working on projects, always doing these different things. He's the, he was like a scout master forever, going on these crazy hikes. Um, and what's interesting is on some of these hikes, we noticed that he'd snore a little bit. And, um, but he started getting these, these anxiety attacks. And these anxiety attacks really like would come out of the blue. This is the guy that's totally relaxed. You could have, all these crazy uh, scouts running around with with knives and with uh, hatchets and with fire, and he's totally calm. He's and good. <laughs> not an anxious guy, but then he's getting these anxiety attacks that were happening, and so we said, "Well, let's let's just step back and let's do an assessment, and see what your breathing looks like." And as it turns out, he had um, mo uh, moderate sleep apnea, and so we then started treating his his sleep apnea, and we started we made a mouthpiece that could then uh, hope hold his airway open, but also start stimulating and growing his jaw bigger so that we could ultimately solve the problem. Now, here we are a year later, and he said that, you know, it probably, his anxiety attacks started going away within the first six weeks of, of sleeping better. And um, he hasn't had a major anxiety attack since we started treating his breathing. So this is, this is such an, a, an incredible thing because it's such an empowering situation. He was um, yeah, he, he's, he's just a, he's back to his old self again. And, um, and it's just really, so we talk about how sleep and breathing affect behavior when you have anxiety, that then is a significant, um, plays a significant role and impact on the things that you choose to do and, and how you act. Well, absolutely. And, it, this makes so much sense. That's, that's why I love hearing you explain that the, the kind of the functioning biology and science behind it all, because it makes sense. Like the brain operates on oxygen and, and good sleep and, and the body functioning normally. And you're saying these, these subtle things can send us into fight or flight. It can interrupt. Well, there's inefficiencies there and in just the exchange of oxygen, right? Just drop the oxygen levels in the body. Again, that's another thing I've been studying recently. Just drop those by a couple of points. There's starting to be negative effects all over right away. And then you interrupt sleep on top of that. Now, you know, mental, mental stuff is going to come up, psychological things are going to show up, and, and physiological and behavior. That's so true. And, and let's, let's just talk about uh, what sleep apnea does to our lifespan, right? The average, I mean, let's com a lot of times we compare that with smoking. If somebody smokes cigarettes, a pack a day, typically that takes about five and a half years off your life. So if somebody, if somebody has, has sleep apnea, studies have shown that takes somewhere between five to 15 years off your life. So it's, it's three times worse than, sm than smoking, what not breathing. the world? Yes. So, so we have to understand that this is, this is not just a, 
a passive thing like, oh, I didn't sleep so well, but this is taking years off of our life. And, and the quality of life and cognitive function and just overall yeah. physiological function in the meantime. Well, That's and when true. you were here, you and I were talking about like uh, a study I'd come across where the inefficiency to lose weight, let's say you're trying to lose weight and get in better shape. Yeah. If you're not getting into REM sleep, uh, it's actually harder. It's harder to lose weight. Um, there's all yes. kinds of side effects that are just tightly connected here to quality of sleep, which is you're saying is uh, one of the thing, one of the things you've observed is breathing quality. Yes. And, and, and back to your point that our body, if it doesn't sleep well, if we get this shallow level of sleep, we might sleep, you know, eight hours at night, but we wake up totally exhausted. We know that we're not getting the good quality of sleep. And, and if we are getting that kind of sleep, our body's going to compensate to get through the day. We, we do kind of, people tend to describe their activities like they have tunnel vision. They're just trying to just get through the day. Mm -hmm. They're not looking for things that will, extra things that, that they can do to enhance their lives. They're just trying to you know, get from point A to point B, get through that work day and go home and just sleep. And they'll, they'll crave 22% more calories to get through the day. And typically using you know that being with uh, simple carbohydrates so that then we then put more weight on and that more weight on then causes more constriction of our airway because our, our, our neck will then collapse as we're, as we're trying to breathe at night. And it's just this negative spiral that continues. And then people tend to get diabetes and um, you know, that inflammatory response, our, our, our own body's um, insulin can't work as efficiently. So we, we are, our, own, our own pancreas isn't, isn't producing enough insulin. So then we need extra medication for that. And we call that type two diabetes. So, you know, and then this strains our heart and, um, you know, and then we start, our body has to compensate and has to work harder to get oxygen to our body than we ele have elevated blood pressure. So if we, you know, w there's a scenario, um, a, a case that, I, you know, one of our patients, she's just a wonderful lady. And she was just, you could just tell she was just struggling in so many different areas of her life. And um, she had type two diabetes, she had elevated blood pressure. She um, had some ch challenges with her hormones. She, she has one son because, and she calls it her miracle son because her hormone cycle, her monthly menstrual cycle only would, would occur once every three years because you know, her, her, her body was so off. And, um, and she was talking about how even, you know, she was kind of angry and, and just, just not, her, not her normal self. It didn't feel normal to her. So we ended up, I remember helping her out and getting, we started with a, make, creating this mouthpiece that it's a special type of mouthpiece. Um, it helps to stimulate and grow the jaw bigger as we're treating sleep apnea. It's, um, it, it's, it's through a company called Vivos and, uh, and full disclosure, I, I have to say that I am a, a clinical advocate for Vivos. I'm, I'm a doctor that helps other doctors and do some, I do some training with them. So, um, and so I, this doesn't represent, I can't represent Vivos as a company, but I'm just sharing you my experience. Right. Um, but this, this, we helped this, this wonderful lady and her son. Um, but she, we started in November, right around Thanksgiving and we got her breathing better. Initially, this mouthpiece helps to artificially open your airway. And we started helping her with that. And and her doctor was noticing, you know, it looks like your blood pressure is starting to go a little low. Let's, let's get you off of that blood pressure medication because, you know, it seems like, you know, that you're going too low here. So she got off of her blood pressure medication. And then she started noticing she was feeling a little lightheaded and started testing her blood sugar and noticed that, oh my goodness, um, her blood sugar was going a little too low. So we got, she, her doctor then got her off of her type two uh, diabetic medications, metformin. And, um, and then what's interesting is, is that, um, and then she started, started sleeping better and healing. And um, she started her, her hormone cycles came back on monthly. And she's like, Oh, my gosh, unbelievable from from once every three years, once every three years to monthly. And so oh. this is where 
her body finally got into this restorative sleep and it was finally starting to heal itself. We were getting rid of all this inflammatory responses coming from the fight and flight response because she wasn't breathing well at night and she was having significant sleep apnea. And, and it, as a result, her body started healing and, and she no longer, doctor no longer, no longer prescribes blood pressure medication for her, no longer prescribes um, uh, metformin for her, for her diabetes. And, and here she is. Now what's really cool is she has more energy and she just, she's, she's not looking at, life isn't like, a, a, isn't in tunnel vision anymore. She right. now has a broader view. She and her son now play tennis. It's a more enjoyable um, situation for her. You know, life is just better. Now, is she right. totally done with things? No, but man, life is so much better for her so much better and again it makes perfect sense right you have more energy more vitality and you feel good as your as your body's functioning like it should but what's in, what's incredible to me is the body will compensate right and so you and i both know people and, and maybe even some of the listeners you guys have experienced or you know somebody it can be off and your body just compensates and you just learn to deal with it and and so you're just going along and you're just like okay we're gonna get through this going on <laughs> And you and I both say, no, man, it shouldn't feel like that. Like that should not be the experience you're having because we both like, like you get it. Like if you, if you get your sleep interrupted or things aren't working right, of course, we're going to be irritable. Like it's hard yeah. to be jovial, happy and high energy and vitality and fully engaged, like really present. Cause you're just like, oh man, I'm just trying to get through the day. I'm just trying to get through the week. And these little shifts can bring back the natural feeling of energy and vitality that we we all should be having absolutely and it was interesting too is she also said that her relationship with her husband improved as well so this is not something we, we promise our patients hey your your marriage is going to get better yeah. but what <laughs> happens is when you sleep and you can and you can actually think and function and you can heal then all of a sudden you're 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 able to um just be happier and and so, yeah, so she's seen improvements with her marriage. She's seen improvements with her, her health and her quality of life is drastically improved. And, and it's all ultimately comes to one going high upstream and treating the blockage of her breathing that then was having these other side effects. But, you know, unfortunately that happens way too frequently that we don't ever look at what the cause is. We just are treating the symptoms. Yes. And yeah. how... Man, it just makes me think here, Tom, I'm sitting here thinking like how many of us without even knowing it yes. are living below like the potential wellness we could be experiencing across the whole spectrum. I love her story because it's the whole thing. It's anything from relationships to, to a menstrual cycle, like the whole spectrum, like where, where we we've learned to compensate or think, well, this is just the way it is for me. This is my life experience. You're like, man, if you can just adjust this little piece here, yes. then, then you go way upstream and then back way back downstream. Now, all the benefits that it's come huge. out so much better. It's so huge. And, and this, it's, it's, it's interesting, right? I mean, I, I wish if in, in an ideal world, where we should be looking to treat our the patients at the very very beginning is probably about our our infants that are two weeks old. That's probably where we should be looking, because what what we what I didn't share with you is is that a lot of this is a function of one not nursing long enough, and two sometimes we have nursing challenges. And I, and I want to share, I, I feel so bad because I feel like a, there's a lot of mothers out there that have this guilt because they weren't able to nurse their children like they wanted to. Mm -hmm. But there are physical things that could be interfering. Lip ties can interfere with a good latch and a tongue tie, not to the tip of the tongue, but even a little bit further back can affect the way that the tongue's able to swallow. So that leads to colickiness and weight loss and and then, you know, you don't want to see your child in the in the 10 percentile. And so all of a sudden you switch, switch to bottle feeding mm -hmm. and that changes how you swallow. And that swallowing then creates this narrowing of the jaw 
that then contributes to what we're what we're talking about in our teenagers and our adults. So, so, so much of this starts with nursing. Yes, and 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 the challenge is some there. I have heard from some lactation consultants that their hands are tied that they can't talk to um, the 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 client about a, a tongue tie or a lip tie, but they look at all these. They try to work around it simply because maybe their medical system doesn't treat tongue ties and lip ties. And so um, it's just really sad. I, I feel like that's an area of a blind side that, uh, that we in the, in the Western developed countries were missing. Whereas there's a lot of, um, there's a, there's a lot of uh, societies culturally that they realize that babies won't thrive unless they do a, a tongue tie release or a lip release. You know, you look at these babies in Africa and the Amazon and, and they have these big broad jaws, but their midwives are really quick. Just if they see that, they, they will uh, initiate a release really, yeah. really quick. So it's interesting, right? To, and it just, plays out for decades. Yes. And on, sometimes on the even it, of the jaw. it goes under the radar, right? Some people might be doing just fine, but then for guys right around the age of 40, our muscles, our, our hormone starts changing, that affects our muscle tone. And then all of a sudden now we get sleep apnea where we've had our, our hormones were protecting our airway all these years. And women right around 45, 50, 55 in the menopause area, that's another time when we really need to be very, very mindful of what, what type of breathing are we, are we doing and get evaluated. This, this is so amazing. Oh, so amazing. I wanted to go back. You, you've mentioned healing multiple times, um, yes. especially during sleep. And most of us think, well, healing, oh, well, were there injuries? Were they, were they in an accident? What's going on? But, but I think you're referring to a different type of healing that happens in good sleep. Will you expound on that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So, so restorative sleep is a scenario, right? Where our body, just from the stresses of the day, if you work out, if you if you um, if, if you're um, exerting yourself, there's certain muscles that get they get fatigued, and so this is a situation. If we are not getting this restorative sleep, and we are not letting those muscles, those um, our heart heal, so we have to let our, give our heart a chance to take a break in order for our heart to work. Is it's the most efficient pump in the world, but if we run it at 110 uh, percent 24 hours a day we we can run into problems and so what they found is they found there's a, a link between atrial fib fibrillation so a heart arrhythmia just a rhythm being off that then can cause other problems with the heart and obstructive sleep apnea so over 50 percent of people that have atrial fibrillation should have also have sleep apnea and so it's so to your listeners out there that that might have a, a mother or father that's taking these medications. Um, one of the questions we should ask their their uh, cardiologist is, have you ordered a sleep study? Mm -hmm. to evaluate to see is that also contributing to it? Because what we do know is is that there's a procedure when that's done is called cardioversion when the heart rate is is off and they go in and they they basically kind of try to re you know get the heart back into better rhythm and they and they found that if they can treat the sleep apnea and their breathing it will stay in rhythm if they don't it will go back out of rhythm again at a very high rate like 78 percent so it's super high wow. um, so it's just one of those things that we really need to start looking at what the the core elements are and still do those procedures of the cardioversion we need to get the heart in good rhythm but Let's also address these outliers that are causing these um, these arrhythmias, and not just right. just treating the the source. Or, yeah. I mean, right, just treating the symptom, not the source. Right, and and this this just makes me like think about. I don't know if it's possible to emphasize enough how all the the systems in the body are so what in, inter interconnected. It's Right, every system from from the heart to blood flow to the nerves to any level of inflammation, and and of course the brain, it's it's all operating together, 
And all you have to do is just get a, a little inefficiency in breathing, a little interruption in sleep, and then it starts trickling again to these other systems. It's so true. And, and one of the systems that a lot of times we totally ignore as well is our urinary tract, right? So a lot of we, there was a patient that came in, um, a, a female in her 70s that was getting up seven times at night to go to the bathroom. Wow. Right? And so, and who would have thought that that's breathing related? So when we addressed her, we tested her and we found out that she had uh, obstructive sleep apnea. We then made a mouthpiece for her. And now that seven times came down to one and sometimes none where she'll go, she'll sleep almost the whole night through. And so once you start getting that complete sleep, you don't get that fragmented sleep. That's when quality of life returns and you have energy. You have the ability to enjoy your grandkids and go on that walk with your friends and go out to lunch and, and, and you get out of survival mode and you start enjoying life more. And that's, what's really so enjoyable about what I do is I get a chance to, yeah, I'm a dentist. So I, I help people with their teeth, but I really love helping see people's lives and families improve because, you know, if you help a child that is struggling with, with school and attention deficit syndrome at school, and then they come in six months later saying, Hey, they're, they bring in the report card and say, Hey, I just got A's in my class. I'm doing better. And then mom and dad are doing better. You have less disruptions. It just affects the whole family. So it's really one of the most rewarding things I do in dentistry. And it all started right from, you know, from it's just this crazy situation where we were, we saw these different events occurring when people were sleeping, when I was doing their dental work, when they were sleeping. It's kind of, it's kind of a massive. So awesome. It's so awesome. Okay. So. Let's dive into then what, what you're doing. What, like, what do you recommend? How do you help people? One, how can we test it? Two, like, what can we do to start breathing more through our nose? And then I guess three or maybe more, the mouthpieces, the, the harder, like what can we do to all dramatically start? And I think I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. I think everyone should do this. It's not like, well, I don't have any problems, so I'm good to go. Like, no, man, like what's, I, I keep thinking about this. Like what, what, what other potentials do I have? Because I'm, yeah. I'm healthy, strong, energized, but I'm like, man, I breathe through my mouth a ton. Let's yeah, cut this back. Well, I, I, and I think let's, let's talk about what the medical, you know, the traditional approach is that the traditional person that they're looking for with sleep apnea is somebody that's overweight, somebody that, um, that has diabetes, that has heart, a heart condition. And at that point, then they're looking to see, do they have sleep apnea or not? But what I have found is, there, there's a, I have a lot of really skinny athletic patients that have sleep apnea and it's because they have narrow jaws. Um, years ago, there was, there was a uh, technique in the orthodontic world that would extract um, teeth and then basically shrink the size of the mouth. And that smaller square footage inside the mouth um, left little room for the tongue and the tongue would fall back and block the airway. And so what I also see is I see a high correlation between um, patients that, that have had those four bicuspids removed for, for a cosmetic procedure that now leading to more health challenges. So um, mm. one of those things where we, we look, so if, if your listeners are considering orthodontics and they're talking about taking teeth out, I would highly recommend that they don't and get a second opinion. Um, you know, if, if, you're, if your listeners are, um, are waking up fatigued and tired, I would highly recommend, you know, getting, doing an evaluation, doing a sleep study. And there, there are sleep studies that you can do at your own home. So you aren't going to a foreign place. You are sleeping in your own bed. They're fairly non-invasive. And, and it, it's really, if, and we can sleep, have do a sleep study for a few nights, not just one night. We can do it for two or three nights. So we can average and really see what's happening rather than just taking one night that could be a good night or it could be a bad night. And, and maybe we're really missing what's going on. And, and um, is that true for kids too? Let's say you've, you've got a child who uh, maybe, maybe this particular child, just, he's just struggling or she's just struggling. Like there's some behavioral stuff. Like, is that, it seems like one of the first places to look. 
Absolutely. If you notice your child's mouth breathing when they're sleeping at night, if you notice they're not breathing through their nose, if they're tossing and turning, they have messy sheets, if they're a messy sleeper, if they're having um, accidents at night, um, those are all signs of sleep apnea and airway blockage. And so who would have thought bedwetting and inability to focus at school is related to breathing? But the reality is, is that it is. And so we, we can we can help with those different things as we help them breathing better and they're, they're sleeping better and they're able to work through those areas as we're growing the job bigger and helping them uh, develop that. Amazing. Okay, so how? So, so how do we so do a test? How, so how do we do it? So yeah, so so I am a part of it. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, I'm gonna make a recommendation to be a Vivos provider. Um, you, you go through a lot of training, and and so not every dentist is trained to do what what I'm sharing. And so maybe one less than one percent of dentists are trained to do this in the United States and the world. And so I would recommend that you seek out one of those dentists. And if, you're, if your dentist is a fantastic dentist and wants to learn, maybe recommend that they get trained in, in, in coming to the Vivos Institute and they can then um, become trained because there's a lot, unfortunately, there's not enough of us that are trained to treat all the people out there. So it's estimated that a third of all adults, a third to 50% of adults have either upper airway resistance or um, obstructive sleep apnea. So that is a high number of That's adults. Huge. And as our population, as we are battling this uh, obesity epidemic, um, that is only gonna go up. So we really need to treat the source of what's going on. So I would find a good, um, I, I'm also in dentistry, we don't have a specialty in, in sleep we don't have, you know, you have sleep specialists in the medical world. In dentistry, what we have are diplomates um, that have done additional training in um, in sleep. So I'm a diplomate in of the American Breath Breathing and, and Sleeping Academy. So um, and there's also um, so that um, there, so you want to find somebody that's that's been trained that's that's passed these exams and know what they're they're doing so that you're they're going to help you get, find the solutions that you need. So, so you want to find somebody that that's, that's qualified. And um, so that's the first step. You want to get a, a sleep study and we can do sleep studies on children. We can do them on adults. Um, if, when we, when we get to, um, uh, yeah. And, and a lot of these, a lot of these can be done at your own home. Um, there's a, a new, new technology that that's, utilizes these special uh, sleep studies that, that, that are very non-invasive and most Vivos providers have access to those. So it's just, once again, it's a, it's a great resource or they're pulling in all these great technologies to help with that. Um, the second thing is, is that we have to start retraining the tongue. If we are, the tongue is a most powerful tool, uh, powerful muscle and it's an amazing tool for shaping the jaw. So if we grow the jaw bigger and wider, but we don't address the tongue and how we swallow and how that reinforces and, and, and goes into the right spot, it can work against us. So we really wanna make sure that, that uh, and so we work with different myofunctional therapists. These are like physical therapists that are trained. Some of them are speech therapists that have additional training in um, the proper swallowing and breathing. And um, so we work heavily with myofunctional therapists. And, and also, and some of these are hygienists that have been trained in this myofunctional therapy. So it's really a, a, a specialty niche. Um, and it's, and they are fantastic to help us retraining the tongue and breathing. This is incredible. And, and, then, and, then, and then the hardware. Yeah, is, there we go. That's all, this is fascinating. That's really right now the best way to do it is is through one of these uh, Vivos providers um, or people that have been trained in in dental sleep medicine that have been boarded and certified. So that way they they've they that they are um, they can really help identify what's going on. And we we work with great um, sleep doctors. You know we have the diagnosis comes from our our medical colleagues. You know we. 
I have a, I work with some phenomenal um, sleep doctors, as well as I work with some phenomenal physicians that can recognize this in their patients. And they realize, hey, they try to CPAP, they're intolerant to it, they can't use it. Let's now treat the source and they refer them to us and we, we work with them. So, so cool. yeah, we, 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 I am really fortunate. I've got a great network of doctors that I work with that, that refer their patients. And, and it's, I, and then yeah. ultimately it's a mouthpiece that is helping expand the jaw, right? If I understand that right. That's the best way to do it. Yeah. So, so we have two choices. We can either do a passive mouthpiece that, that just holds the jaw open. You can breathe better. But what we found is that apnea is even when you're treating the apnea, when you treat apnea with that and also with a CPAP, we understand that sleep apnea will get worse over time. So, so in unless we change the variable of increasing the pipe that we are breathing through, um, ap our sleep apnea over time, our muscle, our muscles, our tissues are going to be more collapsible over time, and our apnea will get worse, and our risk for heart attack and stroke significantly go up. So those are the things we really are trying to to battle and um and so if we can actively help to grow the jaw bigger and wider as we are um also artificially helping the airway open so you get immediate response that you can breathe better then we find that over time we start re-engaging nasal breathing so for me i had i i personally have been treated with this. So I, my whole life, I was, when I was really young, my mom said I nearly died in the hospital because I had a respiratory issue mm. and um, I was able to pull through. They weren't sure I was going to make it, but I, I made, made it through. Um, but my whole life I was congested. I, I never could breathe effectively through my nose. We always attributed to allergies and I took different allergy medication. I was told I had exercise induced asthma. I'd wheeze when I would, when I would exercise and I love sports, I football and basketball and track and every sport imaginable. I had a lot of energy and um, I'm sure I was like a lot of those kids that, that, that my mom felt like I needed, I had so much energy. Uh, I, I wasn't sleeping well at night. I had so much energy that uh, I was bouncing off the wall. So let's focus that into sports. And so that's what, kind of what I ended up doing. And so um, it wasn't until later on that I look back, I see all these different warning signs that, of course, the technology wasn't available back then, but I could have really benefited from this, from this technology much earlier in life. So I started growing my jaw, and, and this is in my mid to late 40s, I'm doing this. So I'm growing my jaw wider, and within three weeks, one nostril that was always plugged my whole life opens up. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is kind of crazy. Is this kind of a fluke? And I, I, I said, okay, well, I keep on wearing the mouthpiece and sleeping better and feeling better. And, and then three months later, the other nostril opened up and they've stayed open ever since. So that's where the hard tissue um, that we were talking about helped to open up the airway from this hard tissue standpoint. Now, when I first started this, I didn't fully understand and appreciate the benefit of buteco breathing techniques and, and, and also uh, lip taping. So I probably could have had it open up even sooner with addressing the soft tissue. Mm -hmm. well. So I think with now when we work with our patients, we're addressing it all at one time. We're, we're working on the soft tissue. We're working, helping address the um, uh, really re-engaging nasal breathing the best we can. Man, this is all so Sorry, awesome. I'm, 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 I get so excited about this stuff and I, 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 uh, I, I tend to talk a lot about no, this. That's I, exactly why I had you on brother. Cause the, when, when you started explaining this stuff to me, it just made so much sense because I get to work with so many great clients and, and my own experience and working with others. I'm like, yes, that, that just fits. And, and these, these are little puzzle pieces again, cause it's a, it's a huge picture. It right? is. The, the human body and life is just very complex, but there it's so often it, it literally can come down to very simple solutions. Yeah. And there's so many things we'll struggle with sometimes for years or decades and you stop and say, okay, is it something we're eating? Is it sleep? Is it breathing? Like yeah. the, you, you look at these pieces first and sometimes that's it. That's your thing. You, you have a child or, or you yourself are struggling with, with this breathing thing. 
that's actually a sleep thing that then turns into major inefficiencies inside your body. And so your fitness goals or your ability to focus at work or studies, like this is being wrecked because of a little thing and you just, there's the solutions right there. Man, I love this stuff. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I, I, I have to agree with you. I, I, I think we need to look at food as medicine and food is, is really, if we really need to focus on an anti-inflammatory diet because yes. really everything I'm sharing with you, we're trying to decrease inflammation. Yep. So as we are stopping these inflammatory responses, these fight and flight responses, when you have these airway blockages, you know, we'll, we'll see some, I saw this, I, we did this one test in this one child and we tested their breathing and his heart rate got as high as 198 while he was sleeping. Holy cow. How I mean, was this child? I mean, trying to get your heart rate that high is really hard. But how is that child, if that's what his sleep is like, how is he going to wake up and, and function normally at school? He's not. No He's just going to be wired. And, and, and he has, has all this inflammatory response. He has his own corticosteroids being built up. That creates more inflammation. And, and just things don't function as well with inflammation. And so what we're finding is that people, as we're helping them with their, their, their breathing, they're able to control their diabetes better. They're able to control their other autoimmune conditions better. It doesn't take away the autoimmune condition. You know, we have fibromyalgia is heavily connected with, with you know, you look at a high percentage of people that have fibromyalgia, they, a huge percentage of them have a sleep interruptions and, mm -hmm. and they have a, a, a different sleep cycle than normal. Right. Um, people with autism, a lot of these, these kids and adults have sleep challenges. Now, if we dress their sleep, will it help get rid of the autism? Of course not. I'm never going to say that. But we do find that they're able to manage their autism much better and improve their learning um, and their abilities to, to function better. Which so makes sense. It, it, it does make sense. So it's just these little things like you're talking about eating well, sleeping well, exercising. As we exercise, we're able to oxygenate our brains, right? So all these things, it... It, we really have to, we really want to oxygenate our brains breathing through our nose versus breathing through our mouth, right? So it's it's really critical as we really narrow it down to these small little things. It has a uh, an amazing impact in so many different areas from depression, anxiety, heart attacks, prevention, to stroke prevention, um, you know, to ADHD, to just harmony in the home. So it's really amazing just to kind of see all these impacts all come down to one root cause of, of not breathing well. And, and something that every one of us can do better. Oh, yeah. And just be cognizant of. And then, you know, obviously when we're awake, when we're alert, practice that, practice breathing the nose, the more sleep, get something. Man, I love this stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you want people to reach out to you if they're in California or they want to go to California and connect with you or search? I mean, how can, if, let's say somebody wanted to be like, look, I want to go, I want, I want to figure this all out. I want to have my family tested. I want to go through this stuff. Uh, do they start searching? Uh, tell us how to, how to get resources. So if you're in, in Northern California, if you're, I'm, I, I live in uh, Folsom, California. So in the Sacramento area, um, I, I'm happy to help your, your clients. And, um, but this is one of those situations you want to be near a, a provider that, cause there's a, there's a bit of follow-up and okay, it's, so it's ongoing treatment, ongoing treatment. So it's not like I give you a mouthpiece and you're done. Yep. There's a lot of follow-up and we want to make sure that everybody is doing well. And so, um, another great resource is going to vivoslife.com. So V I V O S life life.com and find a trained provider in your area um i think that would be fantastic as well and so um but yeah typically what happens is we like to do a very thorough analysis we want to understand what's going on and we analyze the airway um in a process called a, through a head and neck exam so we take photographs of your of your of yourself and your body what happens is you know, we talk about the impact is if you're not breathing well, your head is going to come forward more and you'll have this more forward head posture to help you breathe better. I think and I that, have that, man. And that throws <laughs> off your shoulders and that throws off your back and your hips and your knees. And so it's really interesting to start. So we, we take pictures of the body um, 
And then we also look at your, your mouth and your teeth. We take air, three-dimensional scans of your airway. We take a, it's called a CBCT. So it's a cone beam CT scan of your, of your upper jaw, your sinuses, your nose, your, your airway. So we can see what's impacting this. And we really wanna understand where those constriction points are. So when we are designing a device, um, we can design it specifically for, to address your needs. And when you put together a treatment plan, we can be very, very specific to your needs. Yeah. And so that, that then helps us um, then put a plan together to then uh, create a solution. I love it. Brother, yeah. this is so cool. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for sharing all this. Oh, I'm happy to, to be here. You know, we, obviously we've been longtime friends and, and we have these conversations as we're hiking. And exactly. We're, and then I'm uh, like, we got to share this. Cool. It's so cool. But yeah, no, it's, it's, I'm so happy to be here. And um, I'm, I'm grateful that you were able to be uh, flexible with your timing to, to, to squeeze me in. Cause uh, oh, man, it's uh, like sharing this stuff. It feels like, again, you just, every time we've had this conversation and then today again i'm just like man it, these are simple things i love the upstream it's the go upstream look at simple upstream factors and watch watch how they play out in so many areas downstream R really it does seem unbelievable and I, I use that word on purpose it seems unbelievable how many things are affected by small things upstream that they seem you know so unrelated I totally agree with you. And matter of fact, when I first heard this, I, here I, I was a, a diplomat in dental sleep medicine. I had my own sleep lab. I had treated, you know, a lot of patients with sleep apnea. And then I started hearing these other claims of what this can do. I, I you know, I have to tell you, and I, and I talked to my colleagues and they all thought the same thing. This is way too good to be true. Right, exactly. It's like the magic pill. And, and it's, it's incredible. I mean, it really is. And, um, but it's, I have to tell you, I'm seeing this. And as, as I, I, you know, these are anecdotal things I'm sharing with you. But what I, what I want to tell you is I'm seeing major changes taking place in people's lives as they are uh, dedicated to um, making changes. And it's really remarkable. And it's beyond expectation. It was interesting. I was, I was working with a, another client and, and she was having this, she's just amazing mom, just incredible mom, very busy, um, but extremely fatigued and tired. And, um, and so we, we started treating her sleep apnea and she started feeling better. And, and, um, and she was, I, I shared with her um, the, the story of, of the other patient that, that her menstrual cycle improved. She's like, you know, what's interesting is I had this hormone related acne on my skin that I could mm -hmm. do didn't get rid of and she said but after doing vivos and doing these mouthpieces and sleeping with them and breathing better and sleeping better and healing it went away with me not doing anything so there, there's we'll, we'll find we never promise any of these things right we know we're our main focus is getting you breathing better and sleeping better but what's really fun is to see these other what comes out of it yes. other ripples that take place that, that our patients then report and we see that and, and and we're taking pictures and we're documenting these things but it's it's really remarkable to see the changes that that do take place and um, have you seen have you seen any just i'm curious here have you seen any uh improvements in like allergies or uh illnesses things like that because what you were saying before about breathing through the nose and the nit yes. it's nitric oxide right and the filtering i mean yes. couldn't that prevent or, or help with illnesses and and allergies absolutely so for, i'll take me for an example i my whole life i i had severe allergies i was on allergy medications and did everything i could to treat allergies from homeopathics to to every type of uh, Allegra and Claritin and all these other medications to help with allergies. But once I grew my jaw bigger and wider and I could breathe through my nose, um, my, I, I noticed a, a remarkable decrease in my allergies. So in the back of my yard, we planted these plants for, for um, privacy, these, these big bushes. And they give off this, this pollen that as it turns out, I'm highly allergic to. <laughs> so, Every time I'd go out there, I would have to take a shower. My eyes would run. My nose would run. I would just start 
I start sneezing. I couldn't stop sneezing. And it was, it was just really bad. And particularly during springtime. Well, it was interesting is, is that after growing my jaw and breathing better, I went out, I'm like, okay, I'm going to, you know, I went out and, and was working in the yard and breathing through my nose, sweeping up the stuff like I always do. And I noticed a small little running of my nose, nothing compared to the histamine releases I was getting previously. And I have not had these allergy attacks that I was having all the time, every year consistently yeah. in the spring and in the fall. And so, um, yeah, so for me personally, I can say I no longer take allergy medication at all. I don't take anything preventively. I'm just breathing better. My nose is filtering and, and, I, and it's gone away. So from a COVID standpoint, you know, one of the best things we can do is breathe through our nose. Yep. Well, I know COVID's changing, and, but we are coming into cold and flu season. And if we can breathe more through our nose, that nitric oxide can kill the virus. It can kill the bacteria. It can kill um, the, the fungal infection that's coming through the air. So if we can keep, keep it away from that perspective and we wash our hands and be careful of what we touch and put it touch to our mouth, boy, that's one of the greatest things we can do to help improve our immune system um, and, and keep ourselves healthy and clean. It doesn't necessarily really require all these crazy respirators or, or anything else. We can just- It's, it's already our, built in, like the creation built, like if we can get the body doing what the body was created to do. Yes. It's, it's unbelievable. It, the nose is no longer a hood ornament. It yeah. truly is a functional <laughs> organ. Super, really- Put it back to work. Oh, brother. Thank you. Thank you so much, man. This has been awesome. Oh, my pleasure. Hey, thanks.